Hello everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. July is Sarcoma Awareness Month, and so our session today um, is on Counseling for Hereditary Sarcoma, a Clinical and Genetic Overview. Our presenter today is Irene Rainville. Uh, Irene is a genetic counselor in the Cancer Genetics and Prevention Center at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. As a member of a large group of genetic counselors specializing in hereditary cancer susceptibility, she has sub-specialized in counseling for adults with sarcoma and pheochromocytoma paraganglioma syndrome. Through a hereditary GI stromal tumor, or GIST, study led by Dr. Judy Garber, she has served as the primary genetic counselor for a large cohort of adult patients with GIST, including families with hereditary GIST, and the dyad of SDH-deficient GI stromal tumor and pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. Her ongoing focus is to support genetic counseling services for a large referral network that includes the Dana-Farber Sarcoma Program, the Brigham and Women's Endocrinology Program, and other Dana-Farber disease centers. Um, we're very, very pleased to welcome Irene today. And uh, just before I turn things over to her, I do want to remind you that if you are a genetic counselor who is planning to claim CEUs for this webinar, um, to please uh, complete the entire survey, which will show up at the end of the webinar. So with that, I'll turn it over to Irene. Thank you, Karen, for that introduction. Um, I just want to say I have no conflicts of interest to declare for the talk today. The objectives that um, I'd like to cover for today's webinar are listed here. Um, first, I'd like to provide an overview of the major sarcoma subtypes. And I've included subtypes that are relevant to the hereditary syndromes that uh, we'll be talking about today. I'll next define the key syndromes with, that have an associated hereditary sarcoma risk. And uh, as we go through the talk, uh, we'll be reviewing uh, an approach or different approaches to genetic diagnosis and suggested or recommended management practices for uh, those specific diagnoses. By way of overview, sarcoma is uh, divided uh, between two major subtypes, bone sarcoma and soft tissue sarcoma. The bone sarcoma subtypes uh, are listed below. These include osteosarcoma, which is a major uh, part of bone sarcoma, comprising 35%, chondrosarcoma, comprising 30%, and Ewing sarcoma, uh, comprising 16%. It is estimated, uh, based on epidemiology predictions, uh, that in 2014 there will be 3,020 new cases of bone sarcoma, and of those 1,400, uh, and in that time period, 1,460 deaths will occur. Soft tissue sarcoma uh, consists of numerous subtypes. The types I've listed here, again, uh, will be relevant to uh, the syndromes that I'll be covering. They include leiomyosarcoma, liposarcoma, histiosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, or GIST, and desmoid tumor. In 2014, it's estimated that there will be 12,020 cases of soft tissue sarcoma identified in the United States. And in that time period, there will be 4,740 deaths that are estimated. The first syndrome we'll cover is Lefraumini syndrome, which was identified in, uh, originally by uh, Dr. Fred Lee and Joseph uh, Fraumini uh, as a sarcoma syndrome, which had uh, breast cancer association. Further work defines a fuller spectrum of tumors within Lefraumini syndrome, and now this uh, is known synonymously as SBLA syndrome for the component neoplasms of soft tissue sarcoma and osteosarcoma, uh, breast cancer, especially at younger ages, brain tumors, leukemia, bronchoalveolar lung cancer, and adrenal cortical carcinoma are the core component neoplasms of Lefraumini syndrome. Other neoplasms include GI cancers, notably choroid plexus carcinoma, 
childhood cancers are a hallmark feature, as are multiple primary cancers in a given individual. And Lee-Fomini syndrome is associated with germline mutations in the TP53 gene. Um, the uh, definition of testing criteria for Lee-Fomini syndrome has helped to identify families that are highly likely to have germline mutations in the P53 gene. The classic Lee-Fomini syndrome criteria are listed here. Uh, these include sarcoma diagnosed under the age of 45 years and including first, a first-degree relative diagnosed under 45 years of age with uh, uh, with cancer and an additional first or second degree relative with cancer under 45 or a sarcoma at any age. The Champret criteria have been tested uh, and shown to be highly sensitive for identifying LFS families uh, and they are listed here. These include an LFS tumor under 46 years of age and at least one first or second degree relative with any LFS core cancer uh, before the age of 56 years or with multiple primary cancers at any age or uh, an individual with multiple tumors except for breast cancer, two of which belong to the LFS spectrum with the first one occurring before 46 years of age or any individual with an adrenal cortical carcinoma or choroid plexus carcinoma at any age, regardless of family history. As I stated, the Champret criteria are highly sensitive for identifying LFS families. The TP53 mutation detected the detection rate is well above 20 percent. Less stringent criteria have helped to identify families that may have been missed by uh, the more stringent uh, or definitions of Lee-Fraumeni syndrome. Lee-Fraumeni-like syndrome uh, is, uh, is how this is defined, uh, and one definition uh, was by Eels, uh, and this includes two first or second degree relatives with uh, LFS-related malignancies at any age. When counseling patients that come to genetics clinic referred uh, for their diagnosis of sarcoma, it's helpful to know uh, that an Australian series uh, of unselected adult sarcoma uh, uh, patients estimated that the incidence of germline TP3 mutations was about 3%. And also it's helpful to know that uh, newer estimates of the frequency of germline P53 mutations in the general population are actually um, higher than what was previously thought. Current estimates are that about 1 in 5,000 individuals will harbor a germline alteration. The sarcoma types observed in LFS um, have been uh, defined. Uh, most recently, uh, there are publications um, available analyzing the uh, IR data. Uh, these uh, indicate that approximately 14% of LF, LFS tumors are of the soft tissue sarcoma subtype. Uh, they occur most often in children under the age of 10. The most common uh, type within uh, this category is rhabdomyosarcoma, and this is typically diagnosed uh, in the pediatric uh, patients under age five years. Emerging uh, data from more recent studies are indicating that anaplastic rhabdomyosarcoma is a very important tumor type also in this age group. Other subtypes of soft tissue sarcoma uh, that are notable are listed here. These are lyomyosarcoma, liposarcoma, and histiosarcoma. Bone sarcomas comprise about 9% of LFS tumors, and these typically uh, are diagnosed in the teenage years. Suggested medical management for Lee-Fraumeni syndrome uh, is uh, provided in NCCN guidelines, and uh, this uh, is with uh, some of these um, uh, management uh, suggestions are listed here. It's, re it's suggested that breast imaging start between the ages of 20 and 29 years, uh, favoring MRI, colorectal cancer monitoring by age 25, 
organ targeted surveillance based on the family history and importantly attention to symptoms. It suggested uh, that uh, T53 uh, carriers consider uh, full body MRI uh, under uh, a study protocol Consideration of prophylactic mastectomies is uh, suggested. Avoidance of radiation when possible. A note on uh, the uh, suggestion to avoid radiation. Uh, studies uh, over the years uh, have uh, observed an increased incidence of second uh, primary tumors uh, in LFS patients who are exposed to radiation. Um, and in vitro studies of fibroblasts from particularly pediatric patients have shown uh, that uh, an aberrant behavior of uh, fibroblasts in that setting. And finally, um, LFS uh, patients is, uh, should have prenatal or pre-implantation, uh, 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 should be offered uh, the option of genetic testing uh, in, uh, prenatally or, or uh, for pre-implantation. Uh, genetic testing. The Toronto protocol for leaf Romney syndrome uh, surveillance uh, has uh, defined um, uh, targeted surveillance in addition uh, to um, the uh, more comprehensive survey uh, that uh, is covered through rapid whole body MRI. Uh, the pediatric protocol is shown here, uh, and you can see that uh, for specific tumors, uh, defined surveillance strategies um, are, are, uh, are followed. Therefore, for adrenal cortical carcinoma, ultrasound um, uh, at regular intervals is shown here, your analysis, blood work, and so on. Uh, monitoring for brain tumors is included, um, and that's by targeted uh, MRI of the brain and also um, uh, CBC profile and so on uh, is followed for monitoring for leukemia lymphoma. The adult protocol uh, is uh, different from the uh, ch uh, pediatric protocol because of the different uh, cancer types seen in uh, adults with LFS, and that is shown here. And again, uh, the rapid whole body MRI is included in this. Um, and this is, some, this is a protocol that is practiced at several centers now. Um, one study looked at the efficacy of the, uh, the Toronto protocol screening. Um, there were eight uh, individuals from eight families um, recruited. Uh, and among those eight families, 33 individuals were found to carry germline uh, P53 mutations. And 18 of those 33 opted for the surveillance. Uh, and the others uh, declined. Uh, the, the kaplan meier survival curve is shown here. Um, and although the numbers uh, are, this is a, although this is a relatively small study, um, this did uh, provide an early demonstration of um, the efficacy of uh, screening, uh, presumably uh, because uh, tumors or lesions are identified uh, pre-symptomatically. Uh, this is um, a pedigree of a family uh, that was followed at the Dana-Farber. This individual, um, indicated by the arrowhead, had a history of osteosarcoma um, in her preteen years and presented to clinic after her breast cancer diagnosis, and she was only 28. You can see that the component tumors uh, of leaf Romney syndrome are present in this family uh, with the osteosarcoma in the proband young breast cancer, uh, soft tissue sarcoma in the proband sister, young breast cancer in a paternal aunt, as well as leukemia and multiple primary cancers in that individual, and then brain tumors uh, in the prior generation. For this individual, uh, we were able to identify the TP53 mutation in the family, and uh, she was then uh, able to have uh, pre-implantation genetic testing for her family planning. 
this pedigree provides an example of how uh, Lee Fremini like uh, definitions um, can help to identify families with germline p53 mutations, which otherwise might have been missed um, if testing was restricted to uh, the more stringent definitions uh, such as classic LFS or Sean Pret. Um, in this family, uh, there is DCIS, uh, premenopausally in two sisters, a young breast cancer in their mother, um, and then uh, a, young, uh, a leukemia as well as a, a breast cancer in the a maternal aunt. This family uh, was found to harbor a, a germline a p53 mutation, uh, and obviously this uh, helped to clarify future cancer risk for this, these family members. Next, we'll move uh, to uh, a different syndrome with a different uh, sarcoma uh, type tumor. Uh, we'll talk about familial adenomatous polyposis. Classic FAP is very well defined uh, as colorectal cancer under the age of 45 and the presence of uh, hundreds of thousands of adenomatous uh, colonic polyps. The Gardner syndrome variant um, is characterized by uh, osteomas and soft tissue tumors, notably desmoid tumors. Uh, most FAP patients have detectable germline alterations in the APC gene. Um, and a small fraction of patients with isolated abdominal desmoid tumors uh, will be found to have germline APC mutations. FAP management is very well defined uh, in uh, the most extensive uh, um, summary of this can be found in the NCCN guidelines, of course. Um, but I've uh, listed the uh, colonoscopy screening recommendations as well as upper endoscopy here. Um, the presence of uh, desmoid tumors in a family may uh, factor into decisions about surgery uh, when that decision point arises for a patient. Um, and it's noted that uh, the presence of an intra-abdominal desmoid uh, in an individual uh, may interfere uh, with surgery. Um, uh, specifically uh, the second type, the total proctocolectomy with ileal pouch and anal anastomosis. And finally, uh, FAP management includes uh, monitoring for intra-abdominal desmoids uh, by annual uh, palpation. Uh, and if there is a family history or if the individual um, is a symptomatic consideration of uh, abdominal MRI or CT uh, at one to three year intervals, and then every five to 10 years. And uh, the suggestion of abdominal symptoms should prompt immediate abdominal imaging. This family history uh, is uh, for a, a patient who was actually seen in our uh, sarcoma who was actually referred from our sarcoma center here. Um, this patient uh, was referred actually because uh, it was thought that they, uh, w it, the initial diagnosis of their tumor was um, of a, that, that they had a GIST tumor. Uh, when the counselor met with this patient, they uh, reviewed the family history, which um, was strongly suggestive of FAP given uh, the young colon cancer in the patient's father and also that the patient reported that his father had thousands of polyps in the colon. Uh, the uh, high um, suspicion of FAP for this patient prompted a reevaluation on pathology of the patient's tumor, uh, and uh, the diagnosis was uh, then uh, corrected. Uh, so that he, uh, it was realized that he actually had a desmoid tumor and not a GIST tumor. And germline uh, APC mutation was also confirmed in the patient. The next syndrome uh, we'll cover is uh, hereditary retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is a malignant tumor of the retina, uh, typically diagnosed in young children under the age of five years. Uh, this is a hereditary predisposition. Uh, the hereditary predisposition is associated with mutations in the canonical tumor suppressor gene, RB1. Inheritance is autosomal dominant. Uh, and it's uh, notable that only about 30% of patients with 
uh, bilateral retinal blastoma uh, will uh, be found to have inherited a mutation from one of their parents. Uh, retinal hereditary retinal blastoma is relevant to our topic today when considering uh, sarcoma risk because there is a high risk for secondary malignancy, uh, most commonly osteosarcoma, uh, but also including soft tissue sarcoma, uh, and, a, and among the soft tissue subtype, uh, lyomyosarcoma predominates. Uh, develop, or arriving at estimates of the osteosarcoma risk has been difficult because of the common use of radiation uh, in retinal blastoma treatments. There is a recent study uh, by Kleinerman and colleagues uh, which uh, evaluated uh, the uh, effect of family history on uh, risk for bone and soft tissue sarcoma. And this study showed that actually the treatment exerted a stronger effect on that risk than the family history did. There is uh, no established surveillance guideline uh, for secondary malignancies in retinal blastoma. There are some practices that have been suggested in the literature, such as avoidance of environmental carcinogens, including UV radiation, ionizing radiation, and tobacco use, uh, maintaining a heightened concern for uh, musculoskeletal symptoms or unexplained masses, and then some uh, authors have advocated incre increased uh, breast vigilance or surveillance uh, to include self-exams, clinical exams, and mammography. This figure shows uh, a family with uh, hereditary retinoblastoma and uh, defined uh, germline RB mutation. Uh, the patient uh, indicated with the arrowhead presented to our genetics clinic referred uh, from the sarcoma clinic with a diagnosis uh, of synchronous lyomyosarcoma, uh, two uh, independent uh, synchronous lyomyosarcomas, which is quite rare. Um, the patient reported that his family had previously been in a retinoblastoma study and that testing had been done under research, um, but none of the testing had been confirmed clinically. Uh, and when we reviewed the family history, it was uh, very significant for multiple lyomyosarcomas in his generation. He had two sisters uh, with lyomyosarcoma, breast cancer, and also pancreatic cancer. Uh, interestingly, the uh, retinoblastoma uh, is present in the next generation in uh, a niece and two nephews. However, the patient himself, who was found to be uh, an RB mutation carrier, uh, n uh, never uh, was diagnosed with retinoblastoma in himself. In this case, the uh, clinical genetic testing provided uh, documentation of the familial mutation so that uh, future generations and also more distant relatives uh, could have clinical genetic testing to clarify the risk. And finally, uh, we'll review uh, gastrointestinal stromal, stromal tumors, or GIST, and the hereditary forms of this tumor type. By way of background, GIST tumors are the most common mesenchymal tumors of the GI tract. Most GIST tumors, greater than 80%, are associated with somatic activating or gain of function mutations in the kit uh, kinase, tyrosine kinase, and less, do less often PDGFRA. Uh, most uh, GIST, therefore, uh, express KIT, uh, which is detectable by immunohistochemistry, and this is one of the diagnostic criteria defining uh, the GIST tumor. The typical age of onset for sporadic GIST is 55 to 60 years of age, and the pediatric form is quite rare. Uh, the distribution of tumors uh, along the GI tract uh, is predominantly in the stomach, so 60% of GIST will be localized to the stomach, um, and about 30%, or 35% uh, will uh, 
uh, develop in the small intestine. Less than 5% are identified at, at other sites, including the rectum, esophagus, omentum, and unitary. The histology of just tumors uh, is listed here. Uh, they're predominantly spindle and epithelioid uh, uh, cellular architecture, uh, and the pleomorphic form is rare. Um, it's uh, been difficult to estimate the incidence of GIST uh, in the United States, and part of this is attributed to uh, the fact that um, these uh, tumors were previously uh, diagnosed as leiomyosarcoma, leiomyoma, or leiomyoblastoma. Uh, estimates in the United States are about 7 per million, and this is lower uh, than estimates in other countries, such as Sweden which is about twice that. Uh, the, there are multiple forms of hereditary GIST. Um, however, they uh, are rare. They're estimated to comprise less than 5% of all GIST. Therefore, uh, most GIST uh, will be sporadic. Uh, GIST is observed in neurofibromatosis type 1. There is a familial form of GIST associated with germline alterations in the KIT and PDGFRA genes. Succinate dehydrogenase deficient GIST is now uh, known to be uh, a uh, is now known to be um, uh, phenotypically overlapping with uh, the formerly uh, defined Carney Stratakis syndrome or the Carney dyad of GIST and paraganglioma. Uh, which also uh, is uh, known as her now known uh, as hereditary paraganglioma pheochromocytoma. And finally, uh, although uh, germline uh, mutations have not been identified, uh, which explain uh, the Kearney triad, I did list that here uh, because new genetic mechanisms are uh, emerging, uh, which may explain uh, the Kearney triad, which is uh, named for the triad of GIST, uh, paraganglioma, and pulmonary chondroma. Uh, and these mechanisms uh, that may explain the triad are related to epigenetic uh, regulation involving methylation. Neurofibromatosis uh, is a relatively common uh, uh, um, syndrome with autosomal dominant inheritance characterized uh, by cafe au lait macules, multiple uh, dermal neurofibromas, axillary and inguinal freckling, and iris-lish iris nodules. One study estimated the prevalence uh, that uh, GIST may represent about 34% of all GI tract, tract cancers in NF type 1. Uh, and these tumors typically uh, do not harbor activating KIT or PDGFRA mutations uh, somatically. Uh, there are some exceptions to this that have been reported, but predominantly these uh, appear to arise from a different mechanism. Familial GIST uh, is associated with germline activating mutations in KIT and PDGFRA more rarely. There are a, a small number of families that have been reported worldwide, about uh, 27 at this time. Inheritance is autosomal dominant, and uh, this is associated uh, in some families, although not consistently, with other features. Uh, one feature that is uh, high, uh, indicative, that can be indicative of a familial GIST is uh, the presence of multifocal GIST in an individual. Um, cutaneous hyper or hypo pigmentation, vitiligo. Uh, dysphagia, which may be related to uh, interstitial uh, uh, cells of the cajal hyperplasia, or ICC hyperplasia, and also uh, mastocytosis or urticaria are associated features. In a hereditary GIST study uh, that has been ongoing for some time at the Dana-Farber in 
uh, coordination with uh, another site at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center known as the FLAG study. Um, uh, this uh, was designed to estimate the prevalence of germline kit or PDGFRA mutations among unselected GIST patients. Uh, what's emerged from this study is that germline activating mutations in KIT or PDGFRA are very rare, uh, and in the absence of other features to suggest hereditary GIST, such as other family members with GIST or an individual with multifocal GIST or some other uh, uh, features such as mastocytosis, the chance for finding a germline mutation uh, in uh, KIT or PDGFRA is very, very low. This is a family with a germline uh, KIT mutation uh, where the proband uh, developed GIST at the age of 43 and also um, had hyperpigmentation and the GIST was multifocal. Uh, this uh, patient opted for germline testing, which did identify an activating kit mutation. Subsequently, uh, the patient's mother had uh, a surveillance um, and uh, was found to have a GIST tumor herself, which she previously uh, did not know she had. Uh, therefore, the germline testing in the original program helped to identify the tumor in uh, the proband's mother. At the time uh, of uh, the initial um, contact, the patient had reported that the maternal grandmother uh, died in her 60s with some type of sarcoma that was undefined. Another type of hereditary GIST uh, is uh, now known as SDH deficient GIST or succinate dehydrogenase deficient GIST. Uh, and this, uh, as I stated before, is phenotypically uh, also known as uh, Carnistratakis syndrome of just in paraganglioma. Uh, this has very highly variable penetrance and may even present as a sporadic GIST with no other indicating family history. It is associated with germline uh, mutations in the SDH genes listed here, SDH A, B, C, and D. It's typically not associated with uh, activating mutations in KIT or PDGFRA in the tumor. So individuals with SDH deficient GIST are ordinarily uh, not, uh, uh, ordinarily would not have uh, KIT or PDGFRA mutations in the tumor if this was uh, analyzed. Immunohistochemistry can help uh, to identify uh, patients uh, which have SDH deficient GIST uh, and uh, the SDHB uh, uh, subunit of the complex is uh, typically, it is uh, quite reliably uh, a predictor of SDH deficiency. So um, for uh, consideration of SDH deficient GIST and whether to proceed with uh, immunohistochemistry, um, uh, Dr. Hornick uh, and also um, uh, Dr. Reggie uh, analyzed a series of adult GISTs um, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital to try to identify features uh, that may uh, be suggestive uh, or, or that may warrant or that may prompt further evaluation of these GISTs. And they noted that in a subset of the adult onset GISTs, uh, which came for their review, uh, that there was a histology that was similar to um, GISTs that arose in their pedi uh, the, the pediatric setting. Uh, and this uh, led to uh, defining features uh, that uh, indicate a high likelihood for germline SDH deficiency and which would prompt evaluation uh, using immunohistochemistry of SDHB. Uh, and these features are listed here. Typically, these tumors are, uh, have a gastric location. They have a multi-nodular growth pattern. 
the uh, cell morphology is epithelioid or mixed spindle epithelioid. Uh, there can be lymph node metastases. There is an absence of uh, the KIT or PDGFRA mutations in the tumor. And the tumors have a relatively indo uh, indolent behavior. Uh, as, uh, with regard to monitoring uh, for GIST in individuals with identified germline KIT or PDGFRA mutations, there is no standard surveillance uh, as these, uh, these germline mutations are rare uh, and, are, and uh, our, our study uh, is one of the first to, to start to look at this. Um, under protocol, uh, it is suggested in our center that monitoring may include a baseline standard upper endoscopy and video capsule endoscopy to exclude a GIST tumor in the setting of familial GIST. Uh, similarly, there are no standard guidelines uh, for STH deficient GIST or hereditary uh, paraganglioma pheochromocytoma. Current practice in our center uh, is, uh, uh, has been uh, established to include uh, assessment for symptoms of catecholamine excess, uh, regular biochemical screening uh, for blood catecholamines, a schedule uh, of this annually, and then also annual MRI um, of the region of the body uh, where uh, there is a risk for uh, these tumors, uh, and that's the neck to the pelvis. Uh, this pedigree shows a uh, family with a germline SDHA mutation. Uh, this uh, patient with the arrowhead initially uh, came to genetics clinic. Um, and given the presence of just in two generations uh, that was uh, confirmed in the patient and also the patient's mother, uh, we suspected actually a germline kit mutation, uh, which uh, was negative. Uh, and therefore, um, when immunohistochemistry uh, became available so that we could assess for the presence of SDHB in the patient's tumor, uh, we noted absence of staining. Uh, and then furthermore, uh, SDHA immunohistochemistry was applied in this instance, uh, which showed absent uh, SDHA staining. Uh, this patient was confirmed subsequently to have a germline SDHA mutation. And finally, uh, I wanted to cover some rare uh, inherited sarcoma predispositions. Um, osteosarcoma is uh, observed in excess in autosomal recessive helicase defi deficiencies. Uh, these include uh, deficiencies associated with the RETQ4L gene, that's Rossman-Thompson syndrome and Rabidolino syndrome, also Werner syndrome and Bloom syndrome and have documented excess of osteosarcoma. Diamond black fan syndrome, which is an autosomal dominant uh, inheritance uh, of ribosomal protein deficiency uh, with association with multiple genes, has fewer osteosarcoma cases that have been reported, but there still is a statistical excess uh, in this syndrome. And uh, finally, rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, in the pediatric years uh, is a part of Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, a constitutional mismatch repair deficiency, and also um, germline alterations in DICER-1, uh, where the specific type of rhabdomyosarcoma is cervical type. And to summarize uh, uh, a proposed clinical uh, approach uh, to uh, a patient referred uh, for sarcoma diagnosis, uh, the standard four-generation pedigree uh, with attention to tumors at all anatomical sites uh, is uh, part of this assessment. Uh, and specifically, assessing for signs of a defined syndrome, um, remembering uh, that retinoblastoma uh, may be present in the family uh, of, a, of a patient referred uh, with an osteosarcoma or leiomyosarcoma, for instance, and also neurofibromatosis uh, should be considered as well. Uh, for referrals uh, for patients having with uh, diagnosis of desmoid tumors, APC testing is indicated. And uh, 
for patients uh, with sarcoma meeting Schomprat criteria, TP53 gene testing is recommended, and also consideration of germline testing for patients meeting leaf romani like criteria. And uh, I want to note that at the present time, there is no known association of GI stromal tumor with leaf romani syndrome. For the adult GIST referral, uh, a first starting point can be assessing the tumor pathology. Um, and if this is available at your institution, uh, to have the uh, tumor reviewed for the characteristics uh, of pediatric GIST, and also uh, immunohistochemistry of the SDHB subunit if this is available. Assessing for signs of a defined syndrome, uh, notably neurofibromatosis, which has a GIST association. Assessing for features of familial GIST, uh, notably multiple family members with GIST, multifocal GIST, or the other features. And if uh, there are no associated features and the family history is negative, the likelihood of a germline kit or a PDGFR mutation is very, very low. And finally, if uh, immunohistochemistry uh, indicates uh, uh, SDH deficiency, uh, testing for the SDH uh, ABCD genes uh, is, is indicated, or if there is family history of paraganglioma or pheochromocytoma. And finally, uh, some resources uh, that may be helpful. Um, I wanted to uh, make a special note of the GIST support groups, Life Raft Group, and GIST Support International, um, which have uh, a great deal of information that is um, very well vetted uh, for both clinicians and patients. Also, the um, Leaf Romini Syndrome Association uh, is included here, uh, the Sarcoma Alliance and the, and the uh, Sarcoma Foundation of America. That concludes my talk. Thank you.